And a good morning, football fans. A Tuesday gathering here on the Jacob Media YouTube channel. Joe McDonald along with Jeff Curry's in for John McMullen today on Bird Street 65. Mr. Curry, you look ready to go. Yeah, I guess I am. It might be all that sleep I had after the Saints Jags preseason game last night. Urban Meyer gave me that Steve Spurrier vibe. Okay, well, uh, the Jags got beat, uh, and I'll give you a stat on what's transpired uh, in the first two weeks of the NFL preseason, which almost defies explanation. Maybe you can do it for me. You're a smart football mind, uh, but hold, we'll hold on off on that a little bit. Um, while we speak, we assume the Eagles are on the New Jersey Turnpike, or maybe I'm wrong. Do you know if the Eagles already headed New New Jersey? Are they crashing at a hotel tonight? It is a road couple of days. I know I could tell you if there's no traffic, get up and down the Jersey Turnpike between Philly and uh, Florham Park in about an hour and 45 minutes, but there's never not traffic on the New Jersey Turnpike, so you got to factor that in. Do you know if the Eagles are staying up there or if they're going up and back the next three days for two joint practices with the Jets and then an exhibition game on Friday? So from my knowledge, they left last night. So I'm assuming they're staying for a couple of days, and then I guess they come back on Friday. So they're going to treat it like a road trip. Well, then uh, hopefully they get what they need out of this road trip. Uh, Jeff, you know last week they had the joint practices with the Patriots. They came to town and hung with the Eagles and got handled each of the two joint practice days. But then in the exhibition game on Thursday, they lit the Eagles on fire at 35 to nothing. Uh, Nick Sirianni and most of the players said that they got what they needed out of the joint practices in the week, which I'll take them at their word that they got the better of the play. But it, uh, isn't part of the joint practices to build up to the game on Thursday? That's at least the way the Patriots made it work for them. And I know it can't work for both teams that way, but 35 to nothing. I'm sorry. Doesn't that like wipe away any of the good work you got done in joint practices leading up to a beatdown? You would think, like, because the Patriots had the last laugh, and they were the team that ultimately it seemed like they prepared to play for, I guess if you want to call Thursday's game a practice, I mean, because it kind of is, it's an exhibition game, but it seems like the Patriots were prepared. They, they treated it like a game on Thursday, and the Eagles were like, okay, well, we accomplished what we wanted to accomplish in the joint practices. I would like to see the Eagles kind of, maybe this is a coaching lesson for Nick Sariani. maybe this is, Maybe this isn't even Nick Sariani. It's a little higher up, as McMullen has pointed out a couple times. But I would like to see them, if they do well in the joint practices this week, continue that on Friday. That's what I would like to see as a guy who's uh, trying to analyze how the Eagles are looking and getting ready for an upcoming season. And, oh, by the way, their head coach is noncommittal as to whether Jalen Hurts is going to start and or even play on Friday. We know what happened this past game, and that. I think in part explains the Eagles offensive shortcomings. All apologies to Joe Flacco and Nick Mullins, who we talked at length about Nick Mullins here yesterday. I don't think he's an NFL quarterback. I think the Eagles would be mistaken to even keep him. Um, yeah, they didn't have their number two one or uh, they had to play with both their second and third string quarterbacks. Um, Jalen, of course, gets the stomach ache before the game. Uh, goes off to the hospital, is checked out, is immediately released. So it wasn't something major, but it did keep him out of the game. He's taken all of 10 snaps in the first two preseason games. If he's going to sit game number three out of an uh, over caution that you don't want to get him hurt, how can you think that a guy who's only started four games in the National Football League is going to be ready to start a season off 10 snaps in preseason action? And that's the thing, Jody, this is so unorthodox. This isn't like Matthew Stafford or um, – I'm just going off veteran quarterbacks here. Even Jared Goff. Jared Goff, Jared Goff has played this preseason. He ain't last week because of the joint practices. But I think the Eagles feel like they have a veteran quarterback here, and they don't. They have a second-year quarterback who's only played four starts, and I'll bet he's been impressive in a, in a lot of them, but still, he doesn't have that experience. It's – this is where I kind of wish the Eagles had a coach where and this is nothing against Nick Sirianni, but someone who could overrule Howie Roseman a bit here, someone with a lot of veteran experience and say, hey, look, Howie, we got to play this guy. We, we got to get this guy ready for week one. I don't want him starting one for 10 and have everybody on his case because he started out slow. No, the reason he would start out slow is because you didn't play him 
in the live game reps you should have been doing. The you know these practices they're not tackling. That's what people don't understand. The, the live tackling is happening in a preseason game. They're not really happening in these practices. It, yeah, a couple times they'll, they'll do like quote unquote live hitting, but it's not the same. And that's what worries me about that. I think Jalen Hurts ultimately is going to be fine. And, and you know, for the year, I think he'll be more than fine. But I want to see him do well right off the bat, especially against a team you can beat like the Atlanta Falcons. And I and I get the health issue. I do, but Jalen Hurts. He's built like a fullback. I mean, if he gets hurt, it's going to be a weird injury. It's not going to be because he got hit or anything like that. So that's where I wish, you know, Nick Sirianni had a little more power we could overrule and say, because I think deep down Nick Sirianni would rather play Jalen Hurts a quarter or so this last preseason game. And we won't know how much he will play till Friday. Well, I shouldn't say that. Maybe uh, Nick Sirianni will announce and or uh, uh, be truthful about how much he's going to play here with Jalen Hurts between now and Friday. My guess is, yeah, be tuned on Friday because uh, here on Birds 365, we still might not know day of game as to how much Jalen Hurts is going to play. And th- there's a really simple reason why I think this is, in my opinion, a mistake. I think the Eagles going to pass the ball a lot this year. A couple reasons for it. Number one, they could be trailing in games. Uh, the Eagles uh, right now don't look like a team that is going to finish above 500. Uh, they were 4-11 and 11 last year, and they've upgraded the roster some. Coaching change might make a difference. We'll have to find that out. But uh, and nobody who's trying to be objective is looking at, at this as a double-digit win team. So if that's the case, you could be behind in games. And when you are behind in games, it lends, just lends itself to passing, specifically in the second half. So I think because of that reason, just one of uh, several I'm going to give you, they're going to throw the ball a lot. Number two, Nick Sirianni is a former wide receiver. And sorry, Miles Sanders fans, if you think this is going to turn into a ground and pound football team, just not happening. They don't have that kind of back. I don't think they're going to be a team that's going to come out with a 50-50 or uh, actually run the football more than they pass the football. No, they're going to be typical uh, NFL team 60 plus percent of the time they're going to throw the football. And they've got a relatively new core of wide receivers. Yeah, Devontae Smith is going to be a a uh, major player in this offense. I know he's got a former relationship with Jalen Hurts when they played together down in Alabama. Um, but the, the quarterback has only had so many chances with so many reps to throw to the receivers that he has. Timing is everything. And I don't know that he's built timing up with any of these guys. Game timing. Practice timing. All right, man, maybe he's done some of that. But even at that, Eagles practice timing is what, about 70 minutes, 75 max. Uh, so they, they're only getting so many pass plays in there. That's what scares me about coming into the season, Jeff. Is the timing going to be there between Hertz and his wide receivers? That's what scares me too, Jody. And that's why I think you have the live game reps. I, I saw Friday night with the Kansas City Chiefs. Patrick Mahomes played. He played, the, I think it was 33 snaps. He ended up playing almost the whole the entire first half. And there was some rust in there. You know, he was trying to stay in the pocket, and which is one thing he specifically said he wanted to do this offseason. But there were times he had to flush himself out and he made throws he probably wouldn't make at regular season game. Sometimes he would, but he made some bad deliveries. And um, the one I look at was his timing with Miko Harmon. Now, they've been together. This is going to be their third year, but their timing was off on a couple throws on, and a couple routes there. And they both admit after the game, look, that's why we play these games because – we want to make sure this is right come week one. And they don't play any slouch either. They play the Cleveland Browns. So they want to make sure they're ready, especially if Harvin's going to be their number two. Jalen Hurts, I think his chemistry with Devonta Smith is going to be fine. And from practices, his chemistry with Rager is going to be fine. But you're not getting that game rep. Like, you can tell Jalen Rager struggled Thursday night. He's not used to catching passes from Joe Flacco, and he's not going to catch him in the regular season. So I get Thursday night was unfortunate with the stomach and bug for Hurts or – But overall, this is why I think he needs to play that third preseason game. You know, play the three receivers you you played Thursday night. That's one thing I like the Eagles did. Play Watkins, play Rager, play Smith, and have your quarterback just throw a couple passes to them just just to get their timing. And again, I I beg Eagles fans to do this. I beg Eagles media um, not to do this. Uh, Sorry, not to do this. Don't judge based off the preseason game. If Hurts' timing is off with Rager on Thursday, on, on Friday night, if he plays, then it is. You know, it's a preseason game. 
I want to see that grow week one. That's what the preseason is for. Understood. But then if it isn't ready to go by week number one, oh, we can look back. 2020 hindsight is a beautiful thing and go, you know, if he got more, more work, maybe they'd be more in sync come week one against the Atlanta Falcons, which uh, we're down to just, what, 19 days uh, between now and uh, the start of the regular season. So it's sneaking up on us real fast. All right, let me get your take on this, Jeff. These rumors won't go away. And I don't know how substantiated they are, but uh, media outlets are dropping it as a possibility. In both Philadelphia, where it's most prevalent, but also in the other towns where there might be the possibility of a trade, Eagles potentially doing a deal to get a veteran wide receiver. We've known this since training camp opened up. The relative obscurity of the Eagles wide receiver group. Uh, They don't have a veteran guy here. Greg Ward, who is, of course, a converted quarterback to a wide receiver, has more NFL experience, more NFL catches than any other wide receiver on the uh, Eagles roster. Uh, So they are a really young group. Would they be aided by the the addition of a veteran receiver? Probably. How good do you need that receiver to be? That's a really good question. If you're going to make a deal, if you're going to do a trade, and I don't think it would include draft picks. I think it would have to be a player for player trade. You'd want a guy who's had some resume built up over the course of his career. Do you think Howie Roseman is pursuing this? Do you think this is just media types like, I don't know, Jody McDonald and Jeff Kerr trying to put two and two together and come up, come up with four? Do you think there is a realistic possibility the Eagles will trade for a veteran wide receiver before the year starts? Well, I know there are some receivers on the block. And the Eagles have had the most trades in the NFL since Howie Roseman has become the general manager or that title in 2010. So naturally, you're going to link the Eagles to whatever player is available. Here's the thing. I know Andy Isabella is available on the Cardinals. I don't know if a guy like that helps them. Like, he was a second-round pick. He was taken after J.J. Artega White. So had a really good rookie year by... At least by my standards, he averaged like 21 yards per catch. He was a deep ball threat. Didn't catch a lot of passes, but he was like the third, fourth option. And then he kind of faded out uh, last year. Like he was pretty much non-existent. So if the Eagles wanted to give him like a second chance at a career, uh, yeah, you trade for him. And you trade, you know, pretty much, I don't know what he would be worth. Maybe if you do a player for player swap, whatever the Cardinals need, like an extra safety or something like that, fine. I don't think he would take playing time away from a Jalen Rager or a Quez Watkins, but I think it's more of depth. Like, you, Travis Fulgham's not a good camp. J.J. Artega Whiteside, I've given up on already, uh, you know, even before camp started. So I think he would. that would be a depth move. If you trade for a guy like, I know Mike K mentioned Keelan Cole. I know um, from people I've talked to, it looks like Keelan Cole is on the block. What do you trade for a Keelan Cole who is proven in this league? Does Keelan Cole start for your football team? Yeah, that's what you gotta wonder here. You know, I think the expectations are a little too high on Quez Watkins. I think that's a little bit of fan excitement, even though Quez Watkins is going to help this offense this year. I don't think the Eagles feel he's ready to be a starter. So maybe that's where Keelan Cole comes in. He plays the other outside slot outside Devonta Smith, Jalen Rager. He would play the slot. Um, th- those are the two names that have been tossed around. It, it looks like I'm sure there will be others available. Um, you know, Isabella just got off the reserve COVID list, so it looks like he'll play that Thursday night game. Um, I'm trying to think of other guys that would be available off the top of my head. Um, you know, I, I thought maybe, again, I said before, I thought Anthony Miller would have been available, but he got hurt. Maybe some guys on the Texans, but again, I don't know what they're doing down there. They, they're they trying to compete. They're trying to not, but I, I think it depends, too, on who gets cut. I, I think that's what the Eagles are hoping for, like a big – like a high profile name gets caught or like one of those veterans that can actually help a team out. Right. And that's always a good thought process because it doesn't cost you anything. All you've got to be able to do is convince the guy to come play with you. If he gets cut and he's a free agent, he can sign with anyone he wants. If he is that talented a player, well, then there are going to be multiple teams interest. So you're not going to get them on the cheap. You're going to have to get creative with the ability to do the cap, which is one of the things that we always give Harry Roseman credit for and say he's very good at managing the cap. Um, so yeah, if I were a betting man, I'd say that would be more likely than a trade, but I haven't completely dismissed the trade possibility. Uh, as we've already mentioned a couple times, 
They're in Florham Park, New Jersey this week uh, for two joint practices with the Jets and then the exhibition game, which I will be in attendance for on Friday between the Eagles and the Jets. Let me give you another name. Yeah, the Jets uh, actually have an extra wide receiver or two that they could probably deal with. You mentioned Keenan Cole. Um, they also have Jamison Crowder, who prior to the opening of camp, everybody and their brother thought that he was going to be either traded and or cut, that the Jets would move on, that they could use his salary cap relief if they cut him. Um, he was the Jets' best wide receiver last year. As per the numbers, most catches, most yards, most touchdowns. He and Sam Donald had a very good rapport. Well, Sam Donald's not there anymore. And Zach Wilson, in his couple of weeks since he became the Jets' starting quarterback, and has looked okay, by the way. And I guarantee you he's going to play some. I don't know how much, but he's going to play some in this final exhibition game because here's a novel idea. A quarterback with not a lot of experience in the NFL actually can use preseason reps. But I digress. Um, James Crowd is a damn good player. He is a slot receiver. That's what he is. He's a little guy and has been outstanding in the slot with the Washington football team. They were the Redskins then and the Jets uh, during his career. Do you think the Eagles would be willing to part with a decent player to get a guy who does have a re very real NFL track record and resume? He made a bunch of catches for a bad offensive football team last year for the Jets. Do you think Jamison Crowder's name will come up? this week in conversation between Eagles and Jets. I would love a player like Jamison Crowder on this team, but here's the thing. I think Jalen Rager could be an absolute beast in the slot just because he could take the top off a of defense and you could use that skill set, that, that deep ball tracking to your advantage if you want explosive plays down the field. That's where I think getting a veteran like Jamison Crowder, it would definitely help this team this year. But overall, if you want to put Jalen Rager in the slot, then – who goes on the outside that that's why we're like, cause I don't know if Jameson Crowder can actually do that on a consistent basis. Cause you're right, Jody, he's a good football player. He can benefit a lot of teams. Like I I'll tell you what, there's a team in new Orleans. I could use uh Jameson Crowder right about now. And especially with the, the whole James Winston thing, it looks like he's going to be a starting quarterback. I think there are better teams that could use a, a good football player like Jameson Crowder. He would definitely help the Eagles out. He would definitely help Jalen hurts out. But if you want to develop these young receivers and, Look, I think the Eagles need a veteran. There's no doubt about that. But I also want to – I'm intrigued by Jalen Rager in the slot. I think Jalen Rager in the slot can be a very dangerous weapon for them, especially going downfield, because you're going to have Devonta Smith on the outside. So you put Rager in the slot primarily. That gives him an opportunity to beat slot cornerbacks up and down the field. It gives them an opportunity for more big plays. It also gives Rager an opportunity to get some receptions and some quick catches under his belt, which I think he needs. I think he needs – those reps, I think that's where Jalen Rager fits this football team the best. If you trade for a receiver, I kind of want, you know, I'm not saying a big body on the outside, but a guy who can play the Z a little bit more, uh, a little bit more experience than Jalen Rager, or a guy who can kind of, how can I put it in words? It, it, it's more of a guy that, you know, can can help this team, can make the contested catches. That that's what I want to see. And I know the Eagles had a guy like that for a couple of years, and it didn't pan out, but. I don't think Jameson Crowder is that guy. He would definitely help this football team out, but I think that also plays a role in taking away snaps from a guy who probably could use him in the slot like Jalen Riker. Here's where I have reservations, and I'm not saying they shouldn't do it or they can't do it. I think they're probably going to end up absolutely doing it in part, but I'm not uh, guaranteeing upstanding results. Here's my issue with Riker in the slot. For me, and it it varies from team to team with the system that they run and the type of plays that they use. To be a really good slot receiver, the number one thing you have to have, maybe even above and beyond your ability, just pulling the football and catch the football, and they're usually shorter, quicker throws, so reaction is very important, but the ability to get separation, when separate separation, not this kind of separation, but this kind of separation, and it's got to be, as I say, short, quick, accurate throw, the ability for you to run routes, to plant, to move, to change direction is, is paramount. you got to be able to do that real well. That's not a strength with Jalen Rager. It is That's not, not something <laughs> he does well. So if you're going to move him into the slide, are you pla actually playing to his strengths 
or are you playing to his weaknesses? I think it's a combination. And, and like you said, Joey, you point out the biggest weakness with Jalen Rager. Route running and the contested game. That's where I would be intrigued by Jameson Crowder. So I agree with you there 100%. Where I'm looking at it as, okay, where can we use this guy's speed and get big plays down the field? And if you put him in the slot, it's a lot different than putting him on the outside. You're not going to line up. I, I'm just going to use a hypothetical. They're not playing the Rams this year. But you're not going to put Jalen Ramsey in the slot to cover Jalen Rager. You're not. Jalen Rager, really the only time he would have a quote-unquote mismatch would be like when a Kenny Moore goes in the slot or someone like that when they play the Colts. But they don't play the Colts this year. But overall, this is where I thought the Eagles got in trouble last year. Nickel Roby Coleman was mostly their slot guy, and the Rams, like, they picked him off. They, you know, they torched him. And that's where I kind of like the idea of a Bonte Max in the slot. But those are the type of cornerbacks you're going to see in there. Like, teams usually carry two or three good cornerbacks – but their slot cornerback now is getting more reps because the slot receiver is getting more opportunity. So that's where I kind of like the Jalen Rager intrigue there, where he can catch a ball down the field and use his speed. But this is where I agree with you with Crowder. If Jalen Hurts misfires, I think Rager, I mean, not Rager, uh, Crowder catches one back shoulder, you know, something like that. And yeah, it's only for a four yard game, but it moves the chains. That's where I would like a Crowder-type player in this. So, so, yeah, Joey, if you're going for a veteran-type receiver, especially one that you know can catch the ball, you know can help this team, then Crowder's your guy. I, I, I'm just afraid that they're going to take reps away from somebody else in the slot because the Eagles have guys that can do that. All right. For those of you tuned in at the top of the show, to, to, yeah, McDonald's nice. Kurt's good. He knows it's – where's McMullen? Well, unfortunately, still waiting on uh, Johnny Mac. He may or may not be able to join us today. He's already up the Jersey Turnpike and is waiting for uh, the ability to get in and be able to check out practice. They're not supposed to start for a while, but John wanted to get up there early because he didn't know the procedures. You're walking into somebody else's house, which he hasn't done yet this year. So you uh, leave that much more time to get there and get through procedures. He did text and say, that the Jets are doing testing, so that might slow the process down. So we're going to try and get to Johnny Mac. We're going to guarantee you that we're going to get to Mike Sielski. Sielski, don't bag us now. You're going to make me look bad. I just guaranteed you're going to be on. Okay, Mike? Just in case Sielski's watching. I uh, did talk, uh, exchange text with Mike, and he said he would come on, and we'll talk to him next hour. But before we get to the first break, I want to run this by you, Jeff Kerr, football savant that you are. Um, 33... Preseason games have been played to this point. The Hall of Fame game and full sleds, skeds, week one and week two. 33 games. Would you believe me if I told you that out of those 33 games, 31 of them have been interconference games, meaning AFC against NFC? There have only been two games played that were within their own conference that an AFC team played an AFC team or an NFC team played an NFC team. Would you believe that that's the spread on the first 33 games this preseason? I'm honestly not surprised. It's, I mean, it's almost like baseball in a sense. Do you really play teams in your division in spring training? No. And I, I just think teams schedule teams they don't play this year, which is weird that the Eagles scheduled the Jets because they do play the Jets this year. Now, granted, this is that added 17th game, but still – yeah, these like the Browns and the Giants, they're not playing each other this year. They played each other last year. Eagles and Patriots, they're not playing each other this year. And I think that's how these teams formulate these preseason schedules. They look at, okay, who aren't we playing? Who can't really take anything away from these games that we play in the regular season? And I think that's just how they roll. And I think the best way to do that is the interconference games, the AFC versus NFC. And that's where they can have the joint practices, like the Bucks. They're not playing the Titans this year. And I just think that's what they do now, and I think we're going to see more of that with, you know, three preseason games. Jordy, who were the two NFC teams that, or or were they two AFC teams that played each other? Well, there was one matchup between all NFC teams and one all AFC. The two NFCs that played was, uh, I think it was week one, uh, actually week two for them because the Cowboys played the uh, the, the, oh, the Cardinals. Yeah, that, that's right. They that played was- the Cardinals week one. And I believe the Jaguars, I got to see who the Jaguars played. Oh, Cleveland. Cleveland. Jaguars and and Browns were the only. Every other game other than that has been cross-conference. 
Yeah, that's... You, hold on. Now you, the, I got to ask you the question. Would you like to take a guess at what the breakdown is? AFC winners versus NFC winners. I would have to 31 say games. We got 33 played. Two were intra within the conference. 31 were inter out of the conference. What do you think the uh, WL breakdown is between the two conferences? I would have to say the AFC's won more games. I, you, would, you would be correct. Now, would you like to uh, break down the 31 into uh, numbers for me? I was going to say 20 to 11, 20 and 11. You would not be close. Take okay. another guess. And, and you I, know which direction you should go, by the way, I'm telling you. Up <laughs> even more? Okay. So I was giving the NFC the benefit of the doubt. So I'll go 26 and 5. How's that? What if I told you you need to go higher? Oh, jeez. Is the, the NFC, like, the, I knew the AFC is better than the NFC this year. Is it really that much? Like, how many How do, are you ready for this? Yeah, go ahead. The AFC has won 27 of 31 games oh between the teams oh so far in preseason. And oh, by the way, it was 27 to 2 before the last two games that were played because the 49ers won on Sunday night and the Saints won last. It was 27 and 2. It ended up 27 and 4 over the first two plus weeks of the season. All right, old football savant. What do we read into this? I don't want to say it's preseason, but I'll tell you what I would have told you three months ago. The AFC is just light years better than the NFC, and it's not close. This is why I kind of write off teams like the New England Patriots. Like, if the Patriots are in the NFC, yeah, put them in the playoffs. But, you know, uh, Matt Verderam said yesterday, outside the NFC West, the NFC North is a joke. I'm sorry. The, the Vikings, they're not good. Um they think they could be good because they're in that division. The Bears, they were a playoff team last year, but they did not look like a playoff team at all. And they should play Justin Fields week one. The Lions stink. The NFC South's a bad division. It's Tampa Bay and everybody else at this point. And, you know, the Saints can make the playoffs just because Atlanta's not good and Carolina's not good. We know what the NFC East is. So that's why the NFC West gets so much hype. There's four legitimate teams in there. Really, that's the only chance the NFC has. It's, yeah, an NFC team won the Super Bowl last year, but the five seed from the NFC went to the Super Bowl. Green Bay's good, and they're going to be good this year. But if you look at the depth of the AFC compared to the depth of the NFC, light years away. It's So don't think like when the Eagles play the Chargers or the Raiders that it's going to be a cakewalk because it's not. Correct me if I'm wrong. We're still using the uh, same playoff format this year that they used last year, correct? Right. Correct. Would it be, and I guarantee, well, it's of course, because last year was the first time they ever did it, but uh, would you not be surprised if I told you that not one, not two, all three wild cards come out of the NFC West this year? That it, there's going to be a divisional winner, and you got three wild cards in each conference, that all three of them can come. Now, I know it's going to be very difficult because they got to play each other. I, I don't even know if I would bet this, but I just evaluating the overall talent, uh, taking divisional uh, alignment out of it. I, I think four of the best six teams in the NFC are all in the uh, NFC West. It almost happened last year, Jody. <laughs> it almost did. If the Rams and the Cardinals didn't have to play each other that last week, it might have happened. So, that's how you got to look at it. And, you know, we Seattle made it last year. Um, San Fran was bad. Uh, San Fran got hurt. So you could have had three in that. You could have had three. But San Fran's healthy this year. It, it's very possible. And, and I'm just looking at it just based on the other divisions. The Saints can steal a spot, but can, you know, here's the thing. I think all teams got to win nine games in the NFC West to make it. That's very possible. But, the Saints can play spoiler because they're going to play the Panthers twice. They're going to play the Falcons twice. If they can beat them, Saints will probably end up getting a spot. Um, and they were a division champion last year. The Vikings can play spoiler because they do play the Lions twice. The Bears may be able to beat them once. But the NFC East, forget it. So it's possible. If there was, I wish there was like a Vegas line from Caesars Sportsbook or something. Every team from the NFC West makes the playoffs. I bet it would be. It would be a very intriguing bet just to make 
just on the whole the entire NFC. I do believe it's got a possibility of happening. Don't know if uh, there, there's some analytics and math that would line up against it because they all have to play each other two times, so it'd make it difficult. But it's not impossible that all three of the Wilds cards come out of the same exact division. All right, Jeff Kerr, Jody McDonald, here with you on Birds 365. I look down, I don't see John McMullen's smiling face. We're still hoping to get John on the show. We don't know if we can because he's got some uh, issues traveling up north. And when I say north, I don't mean north of the border like Canada or anything. No, I'm just talking north on the New Jersey Turnpike to Florham Park where the Jets have their team facility. You know, we know the Jets and Eagles will be practicing together, a joint practice later on this morning. Uh, we're hoping to get Johnny Mack up, who is heading up there now. Don't know if we will, but we will continue the effort for you. If not, Jeff Kerr and I will return with more Eagles talk right here on Birds 365. I get scared sometimes. Of a lot of things. Joining in. Decisions. The dark. The dark. But I once heard someone say. But as I always say. It's okay to be afraid. As long as you face the fear. And keep moving forward. Wherever you are in life, count on the name trusted in insurance for over 80 years. Independence Blue Cross. Ah, the savoring taste of a good bag of beef jerky is so enjoyable at any time of the day, as long as you can find it. Here's what we suggest. Pure Bull Beef Jerky is our answer, and soon it will be yours. Locally produced in the Philadelphia region, this high-quality, healthy protein snack is easy to secure. Go to Steersnacks.com, and you'll see hot garlic, tropical heat, Pure Bull Dry Rub, and our favorite, Huck and Fod. What's that? Huck and Fod. Go now to Steersnacks.com. Welcome to the Wildwoods, the perfect place where you can safely do everything or nothing at all. Catch a wave, take a nap, go for a drive, grab a bite. It's your vacation, and we're doing everything we can to make it a safe one. The Wildwoods, your vacation, your way. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local Union 98, is a proud sponsor of The Labor Show with J. Doc and Krause every Saturday night from 6 to 8 p.m. IBEW Local 98's highly trained and superbly skilled electricians are the best in the business, setting the highest safety standards in the electrical industry. So when you're planning your next industrial, commercial, or residential project, choose an IBEW Local 98 union contractor. Learn more at IBEW98.org. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. This is a key. It's a family tree. It's a pair of wings. It's a secret handshake. And a ticket to anywhere in the world. It's more than a uniform. It's the door to a world most people only dream of. There's strong, and then there's army strong. Try it on at GoArmy.com. A Tuesday edition of Birds 365. Jody McDonald along with Jeff Kerr is in for... John McMullen today, Johnny Mack on reporter duty with the Eagles. Uh, we're not 100% sure if he's already up there. He was in transit for sure, getting to North Jersey to be able to be there for Eagles Jets joint practice today. And he's got some holdup, might be uh, COVID testing related. I'm not sure. Uh, but we're still hoping to get John McMullen up here, maybe in the next 25, 30 minutes. Mike Sielski, who has been covering the Eagles for years, Shoot, pretty much decades now uh, for the inquiry is uh, scheduled to jump aboard in hour number two. We're uh, definitely uh, leaning on Sielski propping aboard in our second hour. We'll see if we can get McMullen up here. 
Uh, quick aside before we get back into the Eagle stuff. A couple of things from my last night uh, show on WIP here in Philadelphia. Um, had a caller who said that he thinks Travis Fulgham is getting shortchanged again this year the same way he did last year. That Fulgham got on that run and had a really nice group of weeks together, comparable stats with any other wide receiver in the National Football League, and then he just sort of disappeared. And his explanation, and he put it forth in the preseason here when uh, he had a chance to talk to the media, was, well, you know that we had returning guys from the injured list, and they started to get my snaps, and I wasn't going to say anything because I'm a good Eagle teammate, and now Sean Jeffries, but, but, and there was something to what he said. I won't dismiss what he said, but the way he laid it out kind of overstated it. It wasn't like, the day that Alshon returned, Alshon got all the snaps and Fogum was uh, inactive. No, he played the rest of the year. He just got less snaps. And the snaps that he got, he wasn't near as productive as he was uh, previous to that. That uh, the, the caller that I had last night said, it seems like being shortchanged again. That Smith, because he's a first-round pick. Rager, because he's a first-round pick. Quez Watkins, because he had two big plays in the exhibition opener. One, of course, he took to the house. Oh, by the way, Eagles fans, I know you know this. The only touchdown so far in the Eagles preseason action was the Watkins screen and run to the end zone pass. And the other one that he got behind the defense and Jalen Hurts just overthrew him a little bit. Uh, that Travis Fulgham is not getting a fair shake to compete for his wide receiver position. I didn't agree. How about yourself, Jeff Carr? I don't agree. Uh, you saw me shaking my head, Jody. Uh, no, he's had opportunities this preseason. He Look, if I did a 53-man roster projection and a depth chart, which I did for CBS in June, Travis Fulgham was the starter. Travis Fulgham had this starting job locked up. It was Fulgham, Rager, Smith. Wes Watkins has outplayed the guy. And I like Travis Fulgham. But I don't think he should have said what he said about the Alshon Jeffrey thing. Even though he was right. To an extent, I if I was there, I would have pointed out to uh, – hold on a second, Travis. You played 94% of the snaps Alshon's first game back, and you had one catch for six yards. So the Eagles may have given up on you too soon, which is fine, but I've watched some film of him. Teams have figured him out a bit. Not incredibly. Like, I still agree with him. If you give him his fair share of targets, he's going to make catches. But he's not going to make the plays he was making – against Pittsburgh, against Baltimore when they were trailing and, you know, the single coverage was going back up. Teams kind of, I don't want to say they did a prevent defense, but they definitely were in the more, okay, the Eagles are going to pass the ball. Let's give them the underneath routes and let's make sure he doesn't beat us for a 70-yard game. But I think the kid has talent. I'm a little worried, though. I don't know if he can make the roster or not because he's getting outplayed. He's getting outplayed right now by J.J. Ortega-Whiteside. When you're on the kickoff team and when you're on, you know, basically you're on special teams, you're getting special team snaps in the preseason. They're trying to find a reason to keep you on this football team. And someone will take a chance on Travis Fulgham, but the excuses are getting old. It's okay, dude. Quez Watkins was a six round pick too. You're, so I disagree with this call. He's not playing because he's getting outperformed. You mentioned uh, the depth chart slash 53-man projection you did way back when in June. Have you been doing updated ones? How many wide receivers do you think the Eagles are going to keep this year? So I'm actually doing it today. So that's a good question, Jody. I'm doing it today. Um, I am yeah, Get your work done for uh, other outlets. Go ahead, get it done today. Get a pen and piece of paper out. Write some notes down. So you oh, make sure you remember right what you said. This is my note. This is my note section. So... I'll probably listen to this and say, okay. So I'm looking at keeping six right now. Um, obviously, the three I mentioned, Watkins, Rager, Smith. Um, I do think Travis Fulgham ultimately makes this team. Greg Ward I got making this team. And I, I guess the last one's between John Hightower and J.J. Ortega-Whiteside. I haven't really determined that yet. If Ortega-Whiteside makes this team, it's because A, he was a second-round pick, and B, because of special teams. But – I don't know. I think I just got to see more of John Hightower at this point. I think I'd rather keep John Hightower just because he does have that speed and he 
can help them. I guess I would have to dip into the McMullen pool here and find out, okay, who has been – we're watching that preseason game again. Who's been on special teams? Who's kind of helped this team on special teams? Because that's how you determine the last wide receiver spot anyway. Because at one point I thought they were going to keep four running backs and four tight ends. Because why would you only keep – you know, why would you keep six wide receivers if really none of them are any good? But ultimately I do think Fulgham stays on this team unless they acquire somebody. Four running backs at this point. Is there any chance they go to a fifth? They're not going to go with three because uh, Nick Sirianni, one of the things he has been pretty forthcoming about is it's going to be a running back by committee setup. Miles Sanders is going to be, be the lead dog. We all know that. We all accept that. But he's not going to be, and again, these are all phrases that you can define any way you want to define him, a bell cow back, a guy who's going to get 65 to 70% of the touches of all your running backs. I don't think that Miles Sanders is going to be that kind of back for the Eagles this year. So they're going to lean on their depth, which to me means they can't go three running backs. Is it a given it's four? Is there any chance they keep five running backs if the wide wide receiver position doesn't merit that kind of uh, depth? If they don't go seven wide, does that mean they might have room for uh, five in the backfield if they only keep two tight ends? Well, four seems to be a lot. Um, obviously, Sanders, Scott, Gainwell, Howard. Now you got to wonder, does Jason Huntley fit in here? I don't think Elijah Holyfield does, uh, but I think they, they could stash him on the practice squad anyway. Uh, they seem to like him. But I, I think it's, you know, they like Jason Huntley's speed. Do they feel the kick returner position is prevalent? Or do they think they can use somebody else in that role? That's where I think it, it gets tricky. But you're right, Jody. If, say, they keep two quarterbacks and then all of a sudden the tight ends, you know, you once thought it was going to be four. Well, you know it's going to be Rodgers, Ertz, Goddard. You know, do you go Jack Stoll? Do you go four there? I, I don't think they do. Uh, again, you know, Kerry Angeli, I think he's just practiced by at this point. Maybe they could stash him on the practice squad. But we'll see. Um, ultimately, I, I think it is going to be four. I think there's going to be, I think there's actually a better shot of them having two tight ends than four tight ends. I don't think there's any way possible that they keep four. And if they get squeezed with the numbers, if they decide they need extra linemen, somebody in the trenches, and Goddard and, and Ertz are certainly a lock if uh, Ertz is going to be here and they're not going to trade him, which I think that is, is becoming increasingly more. Uh, the way it's going to go with every passing day in camp. Um, could they let Rodgers go, keep Jackson, put Jackson on the injured reserve as soon as uh, they get him back on the 53, get him back off, then re-sign Rodgers? Or would you try and just get Rodgers back to your practice squad? Now, I think someone else would uh, make a play for Rodgers for the practice squad. Once you get the 53 men down and then you have the flexibility of the practice squad, they might be in competition for Rodgers' service. Do you think there's any chance they go two tight ends on the 53 with Rodgers as their practice squad guy? Now, this is where you brought in my next point, and this is where I agree with you, Jody. Like, I, I think you can stash Tyree Jackson on the IR and just keep him on the initial 53. This is why I look at Richard Rodgers. I was afraid they were going to lose him this offseason, but no one signed him. No one has been signing him. He seems to only do well in Philadelphia. So I think the Eagles know they can cut him. And, you know, again, handshake agreements are handshake agreements. But Richard Rodgers seems to like playing here. So, you know, maybe it's, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to stash him, and then we'll bring you back. Maybe that's the case. But, again, I, I, I kind of agree with you. I think it's more likely we see two tight ends than we see four tight ends. But I do like – you know, them saying, okay, Tyree Jackson's on the 53. We put him on IR, then we create an extra spot there. It's almost like using, um, you know, it, for the fancy football, fancy baseball players in the world. You, you keep a guy, you stash him on the IL so you can sign somebody else, and you know that that guy's going to be on long-term IL anyway. So I think that's how the Eagles can look at it as well. It, yeah, I, you know, I, I think that's definitely a possibility, and especially since the Eagles think so highly of Tyree Jackson because if he was healthy – they'd have a decision to make between him and Richard Rodgers. I'll tell you what decision I would make, Tyree Jackson. All right. I've got a uh, couple of guys that I want to zero in on here as far as their usage in the game on Friday. They're going to practice these next couple of days because Sirianni showed with the way he handled his uh, player assignments in the 
joint practices with the Patriots last week. He used his starters. He used his guys that he's going to be leaning on during the season uh, pretty extensively because I guess they believe there's less of a chance getting hurt in a controlled practice than there is in an actual game. Um, two guys I want to get your take on. How under wraps do you think they'll be? The first one is Isaac Samalo, who's missed a lot of time in preseason because of injury. He's back up to speed. He's been practicing. He's getting some reps in against teammates, but now he gets a chance to get it and get him against a uh, another opponent, a different opponent. But we've seen how the Eagles handle their offensive line. Very protective to this point. Understandably so. Even though I am second-guessing the way they're handling a lot of their players and how many reps they're getting them here in the preseason. I get protecting uh, both uh, Lane Johnson and uh, Brooks. Uh, both of them missed considerable time last year. Brooks missed basically the entire season. Oh, that was a great story that Johnny Mack told us last year that they really work hard to get Brooks up to speed, even with their god-awful record, because they were still mathematically involved up until the next the last week of the season. They were still trying to get Brooks up and ready to play before the season ended. Turned out not to be necessary because the Eagles did get eliminated. Uh, I get it if you're going real protective of Lane and of Brooks. Do you consider Isaac Sayamalo a young player, a young veteran, a veteran player. It's not like he's a rookie, but he hasn't been here as long as uh, Johnson and, and Brooks have. How do you think they handle Sam Malo? How would Jeff Kerr handle Sam Malo if you would decide how much action he was going to get? So what I would do is if he's ready for Friday night, I would play him a series or two just to kind of get his feet wet because I treat him like a young veteran. Uh, so th that's a good term, Jody, a, a young veteran. He's Clearly not a rookie. He's been in the league now. This is his sixth year. He's a guy you know he's going to be your starting left guard. And I don't want to say the, the drop-off is huge. Like, Nate Herbig is a better guard than he is a center. I think we definitely found that out last week. And they can get the job done with Nate Herbig. But you want those five offensive linemen healthy throughout the year. So I think you play him a series or two, get his feet wet. Or, dare I say it, maybe you play Jalen Hurts a quarter. So that would be a series or two then maybe that's how long you play Isaac Sayamalo. You know, just kind of get the, the protections down and all that, which they are doing in practice, but still getting a game rep and seeing against a different defensive front, that will help. So I would play him a series or two, and I agree with you. I get it with Brandon Brooks, north side of 30, Lane Johnson, north side of 30. Isaac Sayamalo, though, I think it's okay to get his feet wet a little bit. It's You can treat him like bubble wrap as a veteran, but it – you are. I like that term, young veteran. Yeah, and I hope he does get uh, in as much as you just described. Uh, if you want to match him up with Jalen Hurts, as long as Sam Malo's in, Hurts is in. As long as Hurts is in, Sam Malo's in. I, I would have no problems with that if that's the way they end up playing it. But again, uh, in case you're just tuning in, in case you haven't been paying attention, the coach has not committed to Jalen Hurts playing at all in the game on Friday against the Jets. We're going to have to wait and find out if he's going to play. We're projecting how much he's going to play. It's not even a given that he's going to play. Uh, another guy who falls into that category, and I need your take on him, is Zach Ertz. Uh, again, and I, I, somebody tweeted me and gave me a hard time because I'm giving media members here in town. You notice I haven't named names, um, but some media members did have Zach Ertz traded in February, March, April before the draft. This is the week within the next couple of days. Zach Wirtz was supposed Today. to be long gone from here. He's still here. Um, and I think he's staying here. I don't think he's going anywhere. I get it that if the quote-unquote Sam Bradford situation happens and a team that is a Super Bowl contender loses a tough flight, tight end is a big issue for them. I, I mentioned this yesterday. Uh, if Nick Sirianni chose after the game against the Jets to give uh, Jason Kelsey a day or two off to go spend some time with family members, maybe one particular family member, one particular family member who plays for the Kansas City Chiefs, if we, he were to go out to Casey to visit his brother and he Nancy Kerrigan, his kneecap, 
maybe the Kansas City Chiefs would go, hey, you know, we could really use Zach Ertz. We no longer have Travis Kelsey, who's the best tight end in football. We got to replace him with a viable tight end. Yeah, I guess that's the way the Eagles could get what they're looking for in exchange for Zach Ertz. In other words, unrealistically, it's not going to happen. How much yeah, do they use Ertz on Friday? Does he go into bubble wrap just because, hey, we can't afford to. We're still hoping against hope that that trade is going to come to fruition. If Ertz gets hurt, that trade is dead in the water. How much do they use him on Friday? I don't even think they should play him Friday. I, I mean, you know what you got out of Zach Ertz. And again, he's another guy I'd like to see, but he has played a little bit this preseason. It's I wouldn't. I just wouldn't play him on Friday. Uh, you know, I think you got to treat him just in case something happens. Like you said, Jody, you know, I don't think the Travis Kelsey kneecap thing will happen, but there's a team in Arizona. I know they don't use the tight end a lot, but they could certainly use a tight end. And I still think Max Williams and Zach Ertz, there's a major, major difference between the two of them. And I think Cliff Kingsbury could really help Kyler Murray out by giving him an ultimate security blanket, especially now that it doesn't look like Larry Fitzgerald's coming back. You bring in Zach Ertz, and I know they run more 10 personnel than anybody else, and Ertz probably won't get the volume he get here, but you never know. Things can change, and, you know, maybe the Cardinals say, hey, you know what? Give you one of our – we got a couple receivers here. Rondell Moore is out playing. Christian Kirk, they're not going to get rid of Andy, uh, A.J. Green, obviously, but, you know, this guy needs targets. You guys have an opportunity here. I think that's where the player-for-player player swap comes in. I, I, I don't know. I'm just hypothetical. This is all hypothetical, of course. I would not play Zach Ertz, though. I, I, I just would not. Like, if he does play, okay, series. And this is where I, I kind of agree. You got – he's, again, north side 30, bubble wrap him. It looks like he'll be here week one. But, again, so much can happen in over the next, what, 19 days? All right. You're not buying into my uh, Nancy Kerrigan – MVP versus Goldberg, uh, shot to the back of the knee. Are you a wrestling guy? Did you uh, watch? Not, not really. You didn't watch Summer Slam over the weekend? All right, never mind. I made a wrestling reference. In I know they are, though. I will say right that. I am good pop culture. So. Yeah, uh, in uh, the almighty Bobby Lashley against Goldberg, Summer Slam this week, MVP went Kerrigan on uh, Goldberg, the back of his knee. Anyway, uh, so uh, he could not even out for a jog, trip up his brother, See if he can wreck his knee. You're not buying into it. I just thought I'd put it out there for Eagle's sake. Here's the reason why I think they should actually think about playing Zach Ertz. Now, this is going to be, I know, stretching the limits of credibility. He's their best receiver. Yeah, I know. Jalen's, uh, they, they use the first round pick on Devontae Smith. And you know how big a fan I am of his. He had two catches left. Two, two, not six, not eight, not 12. Two catches for, what, 19 yards? Not 20, not 25, not 40, not 60, 18 yards. So Zach Ertz, to me, is their best receiver. Not wide receiver, but receiver right now. And he has shown in practice a good working relationship with Jalen Hurts. But they haven't had a chance to do it in an exhibition game. Are they going to try and win that opening game against the Falcons? If you are, if you've already thrown up your hands to go, hey, win, lose, who cares? We're going to go out there on the field 17 times, but we're not making any promises on whether we're going to actually come back with any wins. If you're going to do that, all right, go ahead, get out in front of it and say it now. That'll go over real well with Eagle Nation. Uh, but if you're going to try and win that first game against the Falcons, Zach Ertz could be a key component of that. He needs some more time in games like an exhibition game, like a preseason game, rather than just to practice, catching balls from his quarterback, who, again, we don't know if he's going to play. I need to see Ertz and Hurts out there together on the field to start the game against the Jets this week. You're telling me I'm not going to get that? I don't think so. I, I don't think you'll get that even if Jalen Hurts plays. Now, if Jalen Hurts plays, they might put him in a series or two. But I, I just don't see it happen, Jody. It's just, I'm sorry, Eagle fans, but if you're believing that this season can be exciting and one that you can sink your teeth into, if you're going into just the third preseason game, and I know third is now last in the new world we're in, in the National Football League, and your quarterback and your best receiver as of right now, and Zach Ertz is just that, 
yeah, we're not going to play. We're going to bubble wrap them up. I'm not sure it gives you the best chance to win that first week against Atlanta, which is a winnable game. There's a whole bunch of games on the Eagles' 17-game schedule that I don't see it as winnable. The first one against Atlanta is. I'm not sure if they're prepping well enough to be ready to win that first game. All right, uh, we got almost an hour in the books here on a Tuesday edition of Birds 365. We have not yet been able to establish whether we can get John McMullen on or not. Uh, I haven't checked my private, uh, nothing from McMullen. Uh, we're still hoping that that's the case. We get Johnny Mack up at some point. We definitely believe we're getting Mike Sealski up next hour to join us here on Birds 365. I get scared sometimes. Of a lot of things. Joining in. Decisions. The dark. The dark. But I once heard someone say. But as I always say. It's okay to be afraid. As long as you face the fear. And keep moving forward. Wherever you are in life, count on the name trusted in insurance for over 80 years. Independence Blue Cross. Ah, the savoring taste of a good bag of beef jerky is so enjoyable at any time of the day, as long as you can find it. Here's what we suggest. Pure Bull Beef Jerky is our answer, and soon it will be yours. Locally produced in the Philadelphia region, this high-quality, healthy protein snack is easy to secure. Go to Steersnacks.com, and you'll see hot garlic, tropical heat, Pure Bull Dry Rub, and our favorite, Huck and Fod. What's that? Huck and Fod. Go now to Steersnacks.com. Welcome to the Wildwoods, the perfect place where you can safely do everything or nothing at all. Catch a wave, take a nap, go for a drive, grab a bite. It's your vacation, and we're doing everything we can to make it a safe one. The Wildwoods, your vacation, your way. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local Union 98, is a proud sponsor of The Labor Show with J. Doc and Krause every Saturday night from 6 to 8 p.m. IBEW Local 98's highly trained and superbly skilled electricians are the best in the business, setting the highest safety standards in the electrical industry. So when you're planning your next industrial, commercial, or residential project, choose an IBEW Local 98 union contractor. Learn more at IBEW98.org. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. This is a key. It's a family tree. It's a pair of wings. It's a secret handshake. And a ticket to anywhere in the world. It's more than a uniform. It's the door to a world most people only dream of. There's strong, and then there's Army strong. Try it on at GoArmy.com. You've got a Tuesday edition of Birds 365 here with John Jacob Media YouTube channel. Johnny McDonald along with Jeff Kerr. John McMullen, the usual co-host of this show, has not made an appearance yet. Uh, if you've been following the show, and we appreciate those of you who tune up, uh, turn in uh, every single day, either while we're doing it live and or after the fact, when you go back and see what we had to say. Um, Johnny Mac uh, has reporter duties, and he's with the birds whenever they've got upcoming practices and the like. Today would include a trip up to Turnpike, to uh, Florham Park for the joint practices they're having with the Jets. Apparently, there are snafus on the Jets' end. That uh, his ability to get into the uh, practice facility and the like and testing and making sure that everybody's got their COVID protocol in place has been uh, difficult for those uh, who cover the Eagles heading up there. Uh, so we may or may not get John on today. We always like to get him up and 
uh, get his latest Eagle take as he's uh, going to and heading into an Eagle practice, but that might not be doable today. You're going to have to wait and see. He may just pop up. Uh, Jeff and I might be talking here, and then boom, McMullen's happy face is going to hop up on the screen. If you see him, you'll probably know before I am that he's joining the show. But uh, as of now, we haven't been able to uh, get in touch with John or uh, make sure that John is capable of coming on so it doesn't look like it's going to happen. You just have to uh, wait and find out. Uh, Jeff, let me ask you this about Eagles and roster and decision. You said you've got to do your projected 53-man roster. I asked you about a bunch of offensive positions. We haven't touched on the defense much. And truth be told, since Nick Sirianni ran his first uh, practice with this team this uh, up, up, uh, off season, the defense has been the better of the two units, despite the fact that Sirianni's an offensive coach and that you would think he'd be more hands-on with the offense. I looked at the roster during the offseason, which side of the ball had more talent. I thought it was pretty damn close, as a matter of fact. But so far, the defense has been better in practices. Now, the 35 nothing game against the Patriots the other day. Let's see. How'd the offense play? Terrible. How'd the defense play? Terrible. That's a wash for me. Neither side of the ball did much of anything. But uh, if you uh, check in with the guys who are there every single day in practice, altogether too often the defense has gotten the better of the offense. We think one of the Eagles' strong suits is the defensive line. Uh, that's Fletcher Cox and Jason Hargrove. And, of course, a myriad of guys that they have at the defensive pass rusher position, including at some point we hope a guy like Ryan Kerrigan, who's not been able to do anything for a couple of weeks because of a busted up thumb that he got. But uh, looks like he should be able to go and should be healed. They're keeping him out over abundance of caution so far at this. But here's where I do have a question. Defensive tackle depth. Now, Milt Williams has been a guy who's opened eyes here in – preseason has flashed and made some plays and gotten some people excited but a lot of those plays have come when they moved them from the defensive tackle position to outside that his speed is actually a key component of his game and he's got some quicks out there that some tackles haven't been ready to handle if he is going to play as much outside as he is inside who's going to be part of that inside defensive tackle rotation I'm not seeing as much depth there as I want. Now, if it means they're going to ask Fletcher Cox and Argrave to play that many more snaps, I'm perfectly fine with that. Most teams don't. They like that rotation. They like getting the guys out and getting them right back in and keeping them fresh. Do you think the Eagles have enough depth at the defensive tackle position? That's what's concerning. Uh, before camp, I would absolutely agree, yes. Um, Hassan Ridgeway has not had a good camp. I know the Eagles like him. I think he makes this roster. Uh, T.Y. McGill's had a pretty good preseason. Um, I I'll give him that. I think he has an outside chance of making this team. I'm very curious to see how that plays out because of the Milton Williams situation. You know, do you listen as, as a defensive tackle when he plays in? This is what I think going to happen. I think Javon Hargrave ends up playing over 90% of the snaps this year, assuming he doesn't get hurt. I, I think they're going to use him a lot. I, you know, he's probably, uh, if I had to list the top three players of camp, he's on that list. He's been that good. Um, Fletcher Cox, I think they want to, I, I'm not saying they want to live in his snaps, but I think that's the guy that I think they want to use for the second half of the season when the schedule does get easier. And he can, you know, they, they want to get him back to that 2018 Fletcher Cox form, which I don't know if that's possible anymore, but he's still a really good defensive tackle. I just think they have to monitor him a bit make sure his career lasts longer than it probably should, which is always a good thing. So I think that's where the death comes in. And can Hassan Ridgeway replace him? I, I don't think so. I think that's where you got to remove Brandon Graham inside, which, again, I think they're going to do, but he is 32. Uh, I'm sorry, he's 33 now. That's a possibility. Kerrigan on the outside. I think you can move Barnett on the inside. I think there are ways they can do this. Milton Williams is the same way. I do think they need another body in there. Um, and you can find defensive tackles probably easier than anybody else. on the uh, I think Trayvon Hester just got cut the other day, if I'm not mistaken. So, again, you know, I don't want to flash back to that. But you can find defensive tackles. Um, I look at it as they're going to not have as many defensive tackles as we think, and we're going to worry about it. But 
ultimately, I think what I said earlier, they'll move Graham in, they'll move Barnett in, they'll move Williams in. I think Ridgeway still makes this team. I just think that, you know, because he does know the defensive scheme well and he seems to be a Gannon type guy. But ultimately, I think Hargrave's going to play a lot. And I'll say Cox plays about 75, 80% of snaps this year. So that's where you're going to have to figure out the rest of it. If Cox is going to play 75 and you tell me Hargrave's going to play more, well, then I'm not that worried about the defensive tackle rotation. Because yeah. if you got your two best players out there for more than three quarters of the plays, then you got your uh, you got yourself covered. But that has not been the mode. But then again, shame on me. I'm I'm using the Eagles snap counts from the previous defense with a different coaching staff. How do we know what Gannon's going to do? And judging by what they're doing this preseason is next to ridiculous because yeah, I think they're being dictated to in part by those above them uh, as to who can play how many snaps and who they're protecting and who they're getting off the field. So yeah, I, I want to try and guess how it's going to turn out once the regular season starts, I don't really know. Uh, the one thing I have been able to see, and you pointed out, if again, you're judging uh, the previous administration, Brandon Graham was good at moving inside. Although he is a defensive end, when need be, he can move inside and he does use his quickness to uh, good effect when he's on the inside. And they've done the exact opposite with Milt Williams, who's a tackle, who they've moved outside a lot. Yeah, you might see a lot of that, even though I uh, don't know how much Milt Williams is going to play in the middle because he played almost exclusively on the outside in practices. That might be a, uh, a an often ha happenstance because they may just move Brandon Graham inside and let him play a lot more defensive tackle. Probably shortens the shelf life. You get more beat up on the inside than you do outside. And Brandon uh, wants to stick around and do this for a couple more years. But he is such a good team guy. I got to believe anytime they move him inside, you won't hear a peep out of him. No, not at all. And I think Brandon Graham sometimes likes going inside. I remember, I think it was the NFL film segment he did on the forced fumble of Tom Brady in the Super Bowl when, like they said, he was getting all giddy because he got to go inside on that one play. And, you know, he likes going in there because he likes beating up bigger linemen. And I, I think I actually saw this at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I, I think that's when they showed the, the video. And, you know, he said he, he knew right away. As soon as his initial move goes, okay, I'm going to get him. But can I get the ball out of him? And... You know, we all know the end result of that story. But, yeah, I actually think he likes going inside a couple times because he has that speed factor. And when you got guys like Ryan Kerrigan and Josh Sweat and even Barnett on the outside, I think that definitely helps him too because you got to worry about that. Like, I think we all forget – Eagles fans definitely know this. But I think the league forgets Ryan Kerrigan is no slouch. I think he's going to make such a big difference in this pass rush this year. He is an upgrade over Vinny Curry. And – when you play him the right way, he can be very productive in the limited amount of snaps he's going to get, and that's the type of player he is now. You can line him as kind of, I don't want to say like a joker, but how the Eagles would use Jannard Avery, I think you can use Ryan Kerrigan like that. I think you can line him up on the outside, and again, like I said, you move Raymond on the inside, but man, he can be a really, really good asset to this pass rush throughout the year. And again, that's why I, I treat him with bubble wrap too. And he, I know he had the thumb surgery, but – and I think that's going to be one of the things if the Eagles do win that week one game, I think one of the things is they're going to get the Matt Ryan because the Falcons offensive line isn't that good. And I think Ryan Kerrigan's going to play a big role in that. And those of you who are listening to us when birds 365 got underway, there were two defensive ends that I thought the Eagles should have specific interest in well into free agency after all of the top flight guys that already signed. Two guys that I thought were still top flight that were still sitting out there, out there were Ingram, who even later than Kerrigan signed with Pittsburgh. And, oh, by the way, made a big play in their preseason game last week. I did see that on film. And Kerrigan, who the Eagles got for a very team-friendly number. I was surprised they were able to get him to sign the contract that they did, just a one-year commitment, and uh, I think undervalue for the kind of production that he gave. Even last year, a declining year for the uh, Washington football team where he had been a uh, Pro Bowl level, double-digit sack guy. That was not the case last year. We lost a bunch of snaps last year. He wasn't on the field as much because uh, with uh, both Sweat and Chase Young down in D.C., they took the Yeoman's reps. 
on the defensive end position. I thought it was a great signing to get Kerrigan. Now, we haven't seen much of Kerrigan because he has had injury issues, but I'm with you. I think he's going to be a key guy for them, and they may use him some at that linebacker position. You're right. Kerrigan, Gennard Avery, Osman has played plenty out there, and uh, even a little Patrick Johnson has gotten some snaps. Honesty across the board. I haven't been wowed by any of them. So if Kerrigan can come back and play that position, I think he will. But here's my question for you on the fact that it's going to be a 4-3 defense. I don't know how often it's going to be a 4-3 defense. I think it's going to be a 4-2-5 defense, as a matter of fact, with a lot of uh, deep extra D-backs, nickel, and or dime coverage. Uh, it's going to be, at least in my opinion, the guy who comes off the field most often is going to be the Sam backer. I think Wilson and, and Singleton are going to be on the field. Most snaps for the Eagle defense. Do you think Gannon is going to prefer? And uh, no defensive coordinator ever never wants to admit this, but it's just a fact, Jack. You need to react to the what the other team puts on the field. And I don't know how many teams are going to be coming out with uh, fullbacks, yeah, they don't play San Francisco this year. Um, but it's going to be three wide receiver sets, a lot of times four wide receiver sets, even five wide receiver sets, which means you need massive amounts of defensive backs. Uh, I think more often than not, the Eagles are going to only have two linebackers on the field with an extra DB. Do you agree that that will end up being, quote unquote, their base defense? I think so, um, and that's the way teams are trending now. I, I think that's why you're seeing guys like Isaiah Simmons get drafted as high as they are because they can play linebacker, they can play safety, they can play cornerback. You don't have to take guys like that off the field. You, you know, And I think that's not saying that the Eagles don't. I, I think that's what they're kind of hoping Jacoby Stevens can eventually be as, a, as you know, an extra linebacker, an extra uh, safety and coverage, if you will, You know, kind of like you, you move around kind of like a joker type position. But, yeah, I, I think that's what it's going to be, uh, obviously. Um, I, I think they're going to play three safeties a lot. I think that's why they're hoping Rodney McClaw comes back. I think that's why they're so high on k Wallace because then you can have Anthony Harris in there with them. Um, the three cornerbacks, obviously, I think that's where Zach McPherson comes into the picture a little bit, you know, kind of as an extra guy. I mean, I think we're going to see a lot of Vontae Max this year in the slot. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I think it's going to be a 4 2 5 mostly. I think sometimes you'll see – that 3-4 base, but it won't actually be a 3-4. Uh, I mean, you'll see three down linemen, but I don't think you're going to see, like, the four linebackers. You'll, you know, you'll, you'll pre- that's probably where you'll see Kerrigan in that pass rushing role when you might see a Jacoby Stevens in there or something like that. There's still so many chess pieces that need to be moved with this defense, and I th- that's where I agree you don't tip your hand in the preseason. We are Birds 365. Jeff Kerr in for John McMullen. Uh, looking doubtful that Johnny Mack is going to be able to join us today. Um, but we're hoping that Mike Zielski, a veteran columnist for the Inquirer, has been covering the Birds for years, is uh, good enough to uh, hop aboard. We hope to get Mike Zielski up next here on Birds 365. I get scared sometimes. Of a lot of things. Joining in. Decisions. The dark. The dark. But I once heard someone say. But as I always say. It's okay to be afraid. As long as you face the fear. And keep moving forward. Wherever you are in life, count on the name trusted in insurance for over 80 years. Independence Blue Cross. Ah, the savoring taste of a good bag of beef jerky is so enjoyable at any time of the day, as long as you can find it. Here's what we suggest. Pure Bull Beef Jerky is our answer, and soon it will be yours. Locally produced in the Philadelphia region, this high-quality, healthy protein snack is easy to secure. Go to Steersnacks.com, and you'll see hot garlic, tropical heat, Pure Bull Dry Rub, and our favorite, Huck and Fod. What's that? Huck and Fod. Go now to Steersnacks.com. Welcome to the Wildwoods, the perfect place where you can safely do everything or nothing at all. Catch a wave, take a nap, go for a drive, grab a bite. It's your vacation, and we're doing everything we can to make it a safe one. The Wildwoods. Your vacation, your way. 
The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local Union 98, is a proud sponsor of The Labor Show with J. Doc and Krause every Saturday night from 6 to 8 p.m. IBEW Local 98's highly trained and superbly skilled electricians are the best in the business, setting the highest safety standards in the electrical industry. So when you're planning your next industrial, commercial, or residential project, choose an IBEW Local 98 union contractor. Learn more at IBEW98.org. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. This is a key. It's a family tree. It's a pair of wings. It's a secret handshake. And a ticket to anywhere in the world. It's more than a uniform. It's the door to a world most people only dream of. There's strong, and then there's Army strong. Try it on at GoArmy.com. Jody McDonald along with Jeff Kerr, your Birds 365 duo here on the Jacob Media YouTube channel counting down to a Eagles Jets practice today. Uh, we'll certainly have uh, someone on tomorrow to tell us how the practice went between the two squads. Yeah, I'm certainly intrigued by it, but I'm sorry, Eagle fans, if I'm taking it with a grain of salt because we were told last week, ooh, both practices against the Patriots, the Eagles got the better of it. The Eagles uh, out- outperformed. Uh, had an edge over the Patriots in both of the practices. And then they played the exhibition game afterwards. It was 35 to nothing, New England. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to take more out of an actual exhibition game than, and I'm not questioning John McMullen or uh, Jimmy Kemsky or any of the uh, uh, athletic guys. I'm sure they're giving actual updated reports and accurate reports about who's winning the practice. I want to know who wins the exhibition game. Uh, A little bit more important as far as I'm concerned. I doubt. Do we have our buddy Mike Sielski ready to hop on with us? There's that smiling face. Mike Sielski, thanks for uh, being part of this. How did you get out of going up to Turnpike to watch the Eagles and the Jets practice? Uh, Number one, I don't think I'm part of the inner circle of beat writers um, and columnists who get that privilege. Uh, Number two, uh, I had a dentist appointment yesterday at 10 o'clock in the morning during the window when the Eagles were testing writers for COVID. Um, and so I couldn't get tested in time for uh, the trip up to Florham Park. I would have liked to have gone, um, you know, but I'll just sit here with my vac- my, my vaccinated self will stay in my office today and work otherwise. Yeah, Mike, uh, I, I was in the same boat you were. It's it, it was one of those where, you know, you had to go get the COVID testing. And I I, I could always call them the tier one media. Uh, I guess I'm not considered part of that. So I, I, I'm like you. I, I got too much stuff to do this week. I'll, I'll rely on McMullen and everybody else. But uh, I kind of wanted to bring this up to you a little bit here. Do you like the fact that they're not playing Jalen Hurts as much as they are in the – or much as they should be, I should say, in the preseason? I don't like it or dislike it, Jeff. I think it's a necessity. I think they are not deep enough to risk playing their starters very much in this preseason. And I think Joe Flacco and Nick Mullins' performances so far um, have borne that out. Um, you, They can't afford to have Jalen Hurts get hurt because Flacco and Mullins have been so bad in this preseason. Um, they ought to put Jalen Hurts in a panic room and keep them there until the flight to Atlanta, you know, the weekend of Sunday, September 12th. Um, and I feel the same way about most of their veteran starters, right? Like, you know, Brandon Brooks is playing on two repaired Achilles tendons. Lane Johnson had ankle surgery. Like, the idea that these guys should be playing a lot in the preseason to me is ridiculous. You can't afford to have them get hurt. This roster isn't deep enough to, you know, to – plug somebody in. This isn't a situation like in 2017 
where if Jason Peters is hurt, you know, you have control V, Halapalute Vitae there to kind of fill in and still have the line be stable. This is not that kind of situation at all. They're, they don't have the backups to fill in for these guys. So, no, I, I feel like whether it's Hertz, whether it's Johnson or Brooks or Kelsey or Ertz or Goddard, whoever, like minimize the risk to these guys in the preseason and get them to the to week one healthy. I know I'm going to play devil's advocate here and probably annoy the snot out of Eagles Nation, but facts are facts. That guy, Andy Reid, I think you probably heard of him, former coach uh, out there in Kansas City. He's only gone to two consecutive Super Bowls. He's playing his starters. He's got a quarterback by the name of Mahomes, who they made a kind of financial commitment to, like $300 million. Uh, they, 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 they're putting out there for more preseason snaps than Jalen Hurts is uh, getting here in Philadelphia. Why wouldn't they follow in Andy Reid's designated playbook? Because it seems to be working pretty well. For Big Red. Yeah, but that's not the norm throughout the league, Jody. It's not. I mean, Tom Brady's... Well, maybe the, the league needs to catch up with Andy Reid. Uh, the league... the. But that's the thing. Like, are you gaining that much? Maybe Andy Reid is gaining this huge advantage over everybody by playing his starters more in the preseason. Or maybe he just has Patrick Mahomes, who's freaking great. Um, you know, I, I don't know if... If, if, mo if, if 31 out of 32 teams aren't playing their starters very much... You're not losing anything, in theory, relative to what other teams are doing. And I do think, look, the Eagles have done this for a long time. In 2016, when Sam Bradford was going to be their starting quarterback, he took three snaps in their week one in their preseason opener against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and they got him off the field. And they played in that game Carson Wentz a ton more than they played Bradford or Chase Daniel. And what ended up happening? Carson Wentz ended up getting hurt. And, you know, missed the rest of that preseason. Now, he was fine in time for the week for week one. Well, you could take this discussion in any number of ways. I do think there are a lot of old-time football fans, and I hate framing it that way because I'm becoming one of those old-timers with each passing day, who remember the days when players used the preseason to get in shape and get sharp. And that's not really how it works anymore. These guys don't need the preseason to get in football shape as much as they once did. Now, do they need the reps? Absolutely. Can they get them in practices and joint practices and other situations? They probably can to a greater degree than they once could. And again, with respect to this Eagles team, it is so thin and its margin for error is so small that I think they're doing the right thing by not saying, you know what, let's leave Jalen Hurts out there for a quarter or two because there's so much that you can't control in a preseason game relative to what you can control during a practice, even a joint practice. I don't know if Eagles fans are aware of this, Mike. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I had them, and I was optimistic here, at 8 and 9. I think they're starting you know, 11 on both sides. It's, I don't want to say it's good, but it's not terrible. It's where the death comes in. That's where... It, ultimately, that's the difference between the Kansas City Chiefs, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and everybody else, and the Buffalo Bills and everybody else. So I, I'm with you. If any of these guys get hurt, that's what I worry. I think that's why some of these guys are on bubble wrap. But I wanted to bring this up, too. How do you think Nick Sirianni is handling all, all this? Like, I, I, Basically, I want you to grade like his, his performance so far. He gets an eye. It's incomplete. Um, you know, he's handled – look, he's handled the media much better than he did – in his opening press conference, we all would acknowledge that. Um, but in terms of the team's performance, I think it depends on what you think is like, they don't look, they looked bad, obviously against the Patriots. Um, and they looked bad because they are not deep. Their, their backups are not good. They're, they're just not. And so to your point, Jeff, like they can't afford to lose any of their starters. Cause if they do, they don't have the kind of coaches you know, with the kind of experience that they used to have, you know, I mean, I, I, to your, you know, to, to the point you kind of raised Jody, like I can remember the 2003 Eagles season, let's go back a ways where they lost Brian Dawkins and Troy Vincent and Bobby Taylor for a stretch. And their secondary was still pretty good with Clinton Hart and young guys like Lito Shepard and Sheldon Brown because the team drafted well. And because Jim Johnson was, you know, basically a genius who could figure out how to use those guys. Totally different situation now, you know, totally different. So 
Um, to grade Sirianni, he gets an incomplete. Like, you know, there's this disconnect between him preaching competition and, you know, not playing the starters. But I can understand why he's not playing the starters. Um, and my feeling on him, Jeff, is if the, if the guys he has throughout this season are playing hard for him every week, that's the standard by which to judge him. It is not really whether the team wins a lot of games or loses a lot of games, because I don't think they're going to be very good. I think it's going to be, do they play hard every week? That's what you saw Andy Reed, from Andy Reid his first season, even though they were 5-11. and 11. That team gave it everything it had every single week, and you knew there was something there to build off of because they had McNabb, because they were going to get some free agent uh, money to spend in the offseason, go get John Runyon. I think you have to use kind of the same standard here with Sirianni. Didn't know we were going to get a Clinton Hart reference today, but that's why we have Mike Sealski on to uh, give us that type of stuff. All right, uh, something I asked Jeff in uh, the first hour of the show, got to run by you. Zach Ertz tonight. You told us how you think the Eagles are handling playing time, and it's actually smart because they can't afford to lose them. Zach Ertz, there's multi-purpose to how much he's going to play tonight. I think he could really use the time with Jalen Ertz. But, oh, by the way, Jalen Hurts might not play, and everyone is still clinging to the possibility of another team with tight end as a important position for them, unfortunately dealing with a tragic injury to their top tight end, which would increase Zach Hurts' value. I get that, and I know that it's still in play in part. But I think he's the best Eagles, Eagles receiver right now, wide or tight. He's their best receiver, and if they're going to try and win week one, a little bit more work for he, between he and Jalen might be a real good thing here in this last exhibition game. Is Zach Ertz even going to have shoulder pads on Friday night when the Jets and Eagles take the field? I'd be surprised. I would be surprised. I mean, look, I think I think team executives and coaches kind of bake this into the bread of the regular season. That that the, that the season's going to be sloppy. Play is going to be sloppy the first few weeks, and then. By like week five, teams are going to start to figure it out. They don't. They don't view the. They they view the preseason as what's what would be the word like something just to get through. The real crime here is that the NFL charges fans full price for these tickets to these games because the teams themselves and the coaches and the players don't regard them in the same way that they used to. They just don't. I mean, you know. I'm sure I know Jody can remember this. And I'm Jeff, I'm sure you can remember this too. I can remember the Eagles' second preseason game in the 2004 season where they played the Baltimore Ravens, I believe it was. And Donovan McNabb on the first play of the game hit Terrell Owens on a long touchdown pass. And it was like, oh my God, this is it. This is what we're going to see during the regular season. Look at the difference T.O. will make. And it absolutely was borne out over the next 16, 15, 16 games before Owens got hurt. They were great together. That doesn't exist anymore. Like, we don't know what Quez Watkins is going to be. He might be really good. But just because he took a screen, a, a wide receiver screen, 70-whatever yards, you know, against the Steelers, doesn't mean that he's going to be terrific during the regular season because these teams are just trying to get through this stuff. It's one thing that they're looking at in addition to joint practices, regular practices, off-season workouts, it doesn't have the, the games don't have the cachet that they once did. So I, to answer your question, Jody, I'd be surprised if Ertz suited up for anything more than a snap or two, or if he suited up at all, because even if the Eagles want to move him and think that an opportunity presents itself to trade him, why risk getting him hurt? Then you can't trade him. Like one thing I've been on the fence about, and I've argued for and against it. I think ultimately, I do think they should get a veteran wide receiver in here. Somebody via trade. I don't think the free agent market's going to be the way to go unless you know a high profile guy gets cut and you get lucky, like Antonio Freeman or someone became available, or you know in, in two thousand two. But ultimately, I don't think this receiving core is going to help Jalen Hurts that much outside of Devonta Smith and potentially Jalen Rager. I, I kind of want to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I can see both sides of it too, Jeff. Um... You know, signing a veteran for the sake of signing a veteran, you know, I I'm not sure I buy into that. It depends on the veteran you sign, right? You can sign Ruben Randall, and he may get cut in a couple of weeks, like it would happen a few years ago. Um, you know, and at some point, you have to start finding out about guys like, you know, 
a Jalen Rager and a Devontae Smith. You have to let them play. And, you know, I, it depends on the guy. It depends on the guy it, you would potentially sign, I think, is what it comes down to. And remember, we, they still have guys on the roster like J.J. Ortega-Whiteside and Travis Fulgham who, you know, are technically veterans, like they're young guys, but they're not, you know, it's not like they've, they've, they've been here for a few years. Presumably um, they could fill that in theory, they could fill that kind of role too. Um, I go back and forth about it. I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think probably they, they are not going to do that and I can see why they wouldn't. When you went Eagles Ravens preseason, you know, I thought you were going Mike. The game that got canceled. The turf game. Uh, yeah. In oh, I was yeah. down there on the field because yeah. I saw what was happening. It was at the vet and the turf was bad. And I could see I was up in the uh, boot and I got down quickly to the field because I saw all the coaches out there. None of the players were out there yet. This was hours before the game was supposed to schedule to play. I got within listening distance and Brian Billick was going off. Yeah. I'm not blank bringing my blanking players out on this blank. About, you think I'm going to play on this blank? We'll sue your blank if you think we're going to play. It was uh, 10 of the most entertaining minutes I ever had. And I didn't even have to say anything. All I had to do is stand there, sit there and listen. Uh, very entertaining. But they canceled the game, which means I had to do like an extra hour broadcast because we had to <laughs> fill the time because there was no game that was going to be done. But I got a chance to talk to Merrill for a very long period of time, which was cool. But I digress. Um, this upcoming game, another thing I'm going to try and take out of it, Mike, and I just feel I'm going to be able to learn next to nothing. JG, the new defensive coordinator, which that's what he likes to be called. At least McMullen tells us that. Jay's good with JG. I, I want to know what JG's going to do come week one of the season. I don't know that I've learned anything as to what he's going to do through the first two exhibition games and uh, most of all three of us uh, don't have the liberty of being able to go and watch them in practice and don't even know how much we would pick up on practice because he's talked as much about deception as he has and he thinks that's a key element if they don't know what's coming your defense could be that much more effective when are we going to know what kind of defense coordinator Jonathan Gannon is I would say two or three weeks into the season um I mean, deception is not – I honestly think, Jody, that that's one of the things that has changed about the NFL um, or become a kind of a storyline that gets underplayed a little bit is how much new coaches and new coaching staffs can help a team's fortunes early in the season. Like that – and it's clearly something that is valued around the league, right? Like teams go full vanilla for the most part in the preseason now. They don't want to show anything. They don't want to talk about showing anything. And I do feel like, you know, you can have a, a big advantage or even a big disadvantage uh, if your coaching staff is competent right away or a disadvantage if it's incompetent because teams are figuring out – it's going to take teams time to figure out, like, what you're doing. Like, I think we saw this in 2016 – when Doug Peterson took over, part of the reason the Eagles got off to that 3-0 start with Carson Wentz was because new head coach, new quarterback, what are they going to do? And there's no film on them. So, you know, I, I think Gannon probably looks at it the same way. Like, I'm sure, I'm sure Sirianni looks at it the same way. Why, why show anything to Matt Ryan and Art Smith of the Falcons ahead of September 12th? You know, we'll keep it vanilla. Everything will be you know, a mystery to them. And then maybe we can throw them off, you know, and, and gain an edge on them. And I think in some situations that can actually work, uh, it doesn't work all the time, but you know, I think it's become kind of prevalent around the league to, to do that. Mike, I don't know if we'll ever get to this point. I think coaches sometimes try to send the message. We don't want these preseason games. Players definitely don't want them, but we know the alternative it's 18 game regular season or Dare I say it, 20. I don't think that'll ever happen. But do you think we'll ever see a day, at least in our lifetimes, where there's no preseason? I don't. I don't. And I, I kind of hope not. I mean, I think the solution to this is that eventually the NFL is going to crunch the numbers and try to figure out a way to, like, lower ticket prices so that people actually go to these games. I know they won't. I see Jody shaking his head. Um, but there, there would have to be a price point. I would think where more people would just look at it and say, okay, well, for this number, I'm not going to go to the game, but for this number, I will. I think it'd be smart for the NFL to do that. But 
Um, you know, if the players union has any, um, you know, backbone to it, I, I would hope they would stand against it because, you know, the regular season getting up to 17 games in and of itself to me is too long. And uh, 16 was perfect. I know the NFL just wants to make money hand over fist. I get it. But, um, you know, I would hope the players union would, would be serious about it and say, hey, look, 17 is enough. Um, you know, the damage that's being done to our to our representatives is just too much. You know, 20 regular season games with what we know about CTE and the way the body breaks down and all of that stuff. Uh, we can't do it. Mike, you're a good man and you're uh, trying to put the best interest of Eagle fans and or even players at the top of the list. You know, money's always going to be at the top of the list, so they're not going to do yeah. away with preseason games. Um, question about the Eagles wide receiver core. We want to see Jalen Hurts. We don't know if we're going to see Jalen Hurts in this game. We know we're going to see him as soon as the season starts, and he's going to take every single snap. As long as he's healthy, he's going to play every snap of this entire season this year. And then the Eagles are going to make a decision whether he's their quarterback going forward into 2022 and beyond. Are they giving him a realistic shot to prove what he is if they go into the season with the very young wide receiver core that they have? There have been rumors about them having interest in a veteran wide receiver, which couldn't hurt, depending on who the guy is. Smith's a rookie. Rager's a second year. Watkins is a second year. Even Greg Board, who's the veteran of the group, is still wet behind the ears. Is Jalen Hurts getting a fair shake here with this wide receiver group to show whether he is or isn't a franchise quarterback? Probably not. Um, but... It's the situation that they've got, and in a way, it's a no-lose situation for Hertz. Like, if he performs well and is able to put up numbers and play presume, you know, fairly well with this group, that's all the better for him. Um, and I do think that it's possible for this situation to kind of morph and turn. I mean, remember, go back to 2013-2014. The Eagles at that time talked as if they thought Nick Foles was going to be their franchise quarterback. He was coming off of the 27 touchdown, two interception season in Chip, in Chip Kelly's first year. I was at the draft combine in 2014, heading into the 2014 season. And Howie Roseman sang Nick Foles' praises as a young quarterback that we can build around and he's only going to get better. And I'm sure Jeffrey Lurie felt the same way. And it was only after Foles got injured midway through the 14 season and Chip Kelly decided, you know what? I need Marcus Mariota. I need Sam Bradford. I need an upgrade at that position. And I have the power now to do it um, that they moved on from him the first time. So Lurie can fall in and love in and out of love with quarterbacks and Howie Roseman can to a degree. So I'm not sure how much it would take for Jalen hurts to be able to go to, you know, to show Jeffrey Lurie in particular and Howie Roseman to a lesser degree. Hey, I can be your guy. And you don't need to trade everything for Deshaun Watson, presuming that Deshaun Watson is able to play for any NFL team, given the stuff that he's got going on. And, you know, let's see. Let's roll with Jalen Hurts. Um, I also think from a team building standpoint, and I've written this in the past, having a quarterback who's pretty good on a rookie contract is, is a pretty good thing if you can – have if you have the salary cap room to to add pieces around him. I mean, let's face it, that's how the Eagles won the Super Bowl. They they spent less on Carson Wentz and Nick Foles and were able to add all these veteran pieces who turned out to be really good pieces. And in the end, they were able to win a Super Bowl even without their starting quarterback. So um, I think the situation's pretty fluid. But to to come back to your question, Jody, it, it is what it is. You know, is it fair? No, it's probably not. But let's see what Hurts can make of it. And maybe he doesn't have to be. Aaron Rodgers or Patrick Mahomes or Tom Brady to show that he can be a guy who the Eagles commit to for at least a few more years. Mike, I'm a little worried about this. You know, I'm just looking at it from a fan's perspective. It kind of feels like a process year. I hate to, I hate to say that, but the Eagles fans are going to be watching what the Colts are doing and they should be watching what the Dolphins are doing because they have their picks. I'm at the Eagles get off to a bad start, which I kind of think they're going to because of that schedule. Doesn't it kind of feel like I, – I don't want to say it's full Sixers tank job here, but it definitely feels like – I know they'll never use the term rebuild, maybe transition, but doesn't it kind of feel like that? 
To a degree, yeah. I mean, as much as a transit, you can have a transition year in the NFL, Jeff. I mean, I'm not a big believer in rebuilding in the NFL because player attrition is so prevalent. Um, you know, the average lifespan, career span of an NFL player is two or three years. Um, so many guys get released, cut, injured in, in an off in a season or an off season. A team can remake itself very quickly in the off season. Um, you know, is it a transition year in that regard? Yeah, in that usually the Eagles go into every season saying our goal is to win the division and we have a realistic shot at that. Even when they're bad, like they were last year, the presumption was, well, we're going to win the NFC East because we have Carson Wentz and Deshaun Jackson will come back and blah, 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 blah. So it's different in that regard in that we don't really know what they're going to be, but we think they're probably going to be pretty bad. And yeah, like I understand fans looking ahead to – Oh, well, we can get this draft pick or we can get the, that draft pick or whatever. But I, in the NFL, that guarantee, that doesn't guarantee you as much to me as it might in the NBA, right? Um, you know, you get a top five pick in the NFL, you're still more liable to screw that up, I think, more than a top five pick in the NBA. Um, the Sixers evidence over the last seven or eight years notwithstanding. We'll get to the NBA. I do want to ask about the rise. But before we get there, since you brought him up, Nick Foles, third string, Chicago Bears. No questions asked. Uh, Justin Fields, it looks like right now, is going to be the backup. And I'm going to go with Andy Dalton as the starter. Nick Foles is a third string. Doesn't really fit there. He's probably not happy. I don't know if the Bears are going to keep three quarterbacks or not. Most teams do. Would they really keep Nick Foles, who was told he was going to be the starter when they picked him up last year and now has been all the way dropped to third? Can he talk his way out? And if he does, if he hits the open market, I don't know about you, but I think that uh, the Eagles could actually use an upgraded quarterback because Nick Mullins stinks. He's not an NFL quarterback in my mind. But Nick Foles comes with more than just his skills and his capability. He comes with a lot of history. Do the Eagles want to reopen that door? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. You just look in a vacuum. Yeah. And I said the same thing about drafting Jalen Hurts in 2020. In a vacuum, that move makes sense. You have a franchise quarterback who you've just signed to a gigantic contract. You don't want to spend more money at the position than you than you already have. If you draft a guy high, you can get him on his rookie contract. And if he's competent, if Wentz gets hurt, you have a, a cost-effective alternative. And you can develop him. And if Wentz really gets hurt, maybe you've got a guy who can play and, and become something. And if Wentz comes back, then you can maybe trade this kid. That sounds great in a vacuum. The reality was drafting Jalen Hurts sent Carson Wentz off on – I've been betrayed by the organization. I'm not the man. The Eagles totally misread how Wentz would react to that situation. I put blame on both sides, both for Wentz and both on Wentz and the Eagles. And it became so bad that so toxic you had to trade Carson Wentz. In a vacuum, you're right, Jody. Nick Foles is a veteran quarterback, can step into a situation, is familiar with Philadelphia, et cetera, et cetera. This is not a vacuum. This is Nick Foles is a Super Bowl hero in Philadelphia. And if you bring him in, you're undercutting Jalen Hurts because the pressure to play him would be so great that it would cause a sideshow, I think, that the Eagles should avoid. Um, and they should have learned their lesson from what happened just a couple of years ago um, with Hurts and with Wentz coming back in 2018 after he had won the Super Bowl with Full still there over his shoulder. Mike, I want to bring this up with Andy Reid again. Um, I dug a very interesting stat about him. Um, and he can do this this year. He's the only head coach to take two different teams to three straight conference style games. He has the opportunity to do that now with the Eagles and the Chiefs four consecutive, and that that's only been done seven times in NFL history. Where do you see Andy Reid? It, 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 and I'm going to assume he does this this year, and the Chiefs win the Super Bowl. We'll we'll go in the crystal ball a bit. Where does he rank among like the greatest head coaches ever at this point? He's moving up the rankings. I mean, he's a, he's a slam dunk Hall of Famer. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt about that anymore. I think in terms of his influence around the league, it's something that I, I don't think people in Philadelphia really appreciate. I've written about this. What he did in terms of uh, allowing 
offensive concepts that had been bubbling below the NFL surface in college and even at high school to come up to the NFL um, is, has in some ways revolutionized the league. Uh, you look at his coaching tree and the number of head coaches around the league who worked for Andy Reid. Um, he's, I, I mean, you can make an argument that Andy Reid's a top 10 head coach of all time in this league and moving up with a bullet. Um, and I know th there's a segment of the, the Eagles fan base that will hate him forever, that will mock him for times yours and, and not winning a Super Bowl and getting to all those championship games and not winning them and et cetera, et cetera. But Andy Reid is an all-time great NFL head coach. He is. And, um, yeah, I think people should recognize him as such. So uh, since you gave just a, such a glowing uh, retrospective of Andy Reid, I assume you expect he's going to his third consecutive Super Bowl? I'd be surprised if they didn't. I think Buffalo's got a chance. Uh, they're, they're the lone team in the AFC that yeah, I think. Who's, the, who's Buffalo's head coach, Jody? Sean McDermott and Andy Reid. That's who's off the Andy yeah, Reid tree. Two, Very true. Yeah. Either way, it's an Andy Reid win. <laughs> I see where you go with that. Uh, uh, I got a win-win uh, right there. <laughs> All right. Uh, one last thing for me and Mike. We appreciate greatly that you came on the show today. Um, has there been a guy in Eagle camp? And I'm going to take... Devonta Smith out of the equation because he was the 10th overall pick of the draft. And it's very easy to say the number one pick. Uh, but someone other than Devonta Smith, who you've seen, rookie and or addition from outside, or even a guy who hasn't had a chance to, bl uh, to play yet and has been here for a year or two that you think is just going to blossom. Is there a guy that's caught your attention either through the grapevine with practice and or in the two exhibition games? I think it's kind of hard to say the exhibition games because they haven't been real good. But is there a guy that you're uh, excited about watching this year that you think he's got a chance to uh, overachieve and or blow by expectations? Uh, I would say three guys. I would say we talked about him earlier, Quez Watkins. I'm curious to see if he can translate what he's done in the practices in the preseason and even what he flashed a little bit last season into uh, you know, the regular season over the long term. Josh Sweat, um, I, I'm, I'm eager to see him. I'm, I'm always most curious, Jody, about guys who, like, take a big leap after a couple of years in the league. Like, you know, does it just take time for them to physically mature, to gain some experience? We saw flashes, again, from Sweat last season, um, you know, high pressure and sack ratio relative to the number of times he was on the field. He's going to be on the field more often, I think. I want to see more from him. And then the last guy would be Alex Singleton, who had an excellent season last year for them at linebacker and has continued that so far. And who I think that's interesting to me because the Eagles haven't had playmakers at linebacker in a long time. They haven't valued that position. And so they kind of stumbled into it with Singleton. And I, I'm curious to see if he continues to play as well this season as he did last season and, and as he did during, you know, in that Patriots game, he was pretty good in that Patriots game. Yeah, he was which, was, so, which was otherwise not good in any regard. One of the lone shiners for the Eagles yeah. in that Patriot game. You are correct there. All right. Uh, give us the details on the rise. Your Kobe Bryant book. I know I, I think I read fall was when it was officially going out, but people can pre-order at a time. What's the deal with the rise? Uh, so the rise, uh, Kobe Bryant and the pursuit of immortality hits stores on January 11th. Oh, you not can Jen, why did I think it was fall? I thought it was going to be fall too, but they, um, they wanted it after the new year. Um, it's publishing logic. I, I don't, I don't know it, uh, or get it. I would have thought Christmas would have been a good time, but they want it, <laughs> they want it for January. Um, you can pre-order it now on Amazon and Macmillan's, uh, you know, the publishing house's website. We're also going to have, I'm also in the midst of writing and uh, producing a podcast called Young Mamba that uh, is going to be available um, to listen to in November or December. I'm writing scripts for that and I'm going to start narrating it too. It's going to be a 10 part narrative podcast about Kobe and his young life. It's going to complement the book. So, uh, you know, look for stuff related to that as well in the weeks to come. Well, you know, we're going to have you on before the uh, podcast starts and certainly before the book comes out. Mike, thanks for hopping on with us today. We'll get back to you again soon enough, brother. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Mike Sielski, uh, veteran columnist, has been covering the Philadelphia sports scene. Does it all, but uh, we're Birds 365, so we tap into his eagle expertise whenever he jumps on board with us. Us being Jody McDonald and Jeff Kerr, we'll come back. Final time out. Put a bow on the show couple more things to touch on before we get to uh, the Eagles and the Jets 
inter-squad practices, joint practices today here on Birds 365. I get scared sometimes. Of a lot of things. Joining in. Decisions. The dark. The dark. But I once heard someone say. But as I always say. It's okay to be afraid. As long as you face the fear. And keep moving forward. Wherever you are in life, count on the name trusted in insurance for over 80 years. Independence Blue Cross. Ah, the savoring taste of a good bag of beef jerky is so enjoyable at any time of the day, as long as you can find it. Here's what we suggest. Pure Bull Beef Jerky is our answer, and soon it will be yours. Locally produced in the Philadelphia region, this high-quality, healthy protein snack is easy to secure. Go to Steersnacks.com, and you'll see hot garlic, tropical heat, Pure Bull Dry Rub, and our favorite, Huck and Fod. What's that? Huck and Fod. Go now to Steersnacks.com. Welcome to the Wildwoods, the perfect place where you can safely do everything or nothing at all. Catch a wave, take a nap, go for a drive, grab a bite. It's your vacation, and we're doing everything we can to make it a safe one. The Wildwoods. Your vacation, your way. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local Union 98, is a proud sponsor of The Labor Show with J. Doc and Krause every Saturday night from 6 to 8 p.m. IBEW Local 98's highly trained and superbly skilled electricians are the best in the business, setting the highest safety standards in the electrical industry. So when you're planning your next industrial, commercial, or residential project, choose an IBEW Local 98 union contractor. Learn more at IBEW98.org. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. This is a key. It's a family tree. It's a pair of wings. It's a secret handshake. And a ticket to anywhere in the world. It's more than a uniform. It's the door to a world most people only dream of. There's strong, and then there's Army strong. Try it on at GoArmy.com. Jeff Kerr and Jody McDonald, your Birds 365 duo coming down the home stretch. Only a couple of minutes left for this one, uh, as you can realize now, since you've either been watching since we started or as we get it done and wrapped up and put it up on the YouTube channel. As you are uh, fast forwarding through it, if you were looking to see John McMahon, didn't happen. Johnny Mac got caught up in what he described as a, no, I can't use that phrase. I, I Even though we have much relaxed terms here on YouTube, I have my radio instincts that tell me there are certain words I shouldn't be saying over the airway. So I'll uh, refer, uh, hold back from using the words that McMullen uh, used to describe the situation that he was getting himself into up at uh, Jets and Eagles practice uh hopefully he does get inside hopefully we get a report from him hopefully we get him on tomorrow uh we'll certainly get reports as to what came down in the practice but that's not for another 22 hours um jeff kerr uh i need you to make a pick on a game for me this week um no thursday night football action eagles have been on thursday night two weeks run and they still have uh, basically the first game of the week again this week uh, the Colts and Lions actually play at 7 o'clock or get underway at 7 o'clock on Friday. The Eagles and Jets get underway at 7.30. But they play on Friday, and there's four games on Friday this week and then uh, the rest the rest of the weekend, but no Thursday night game. Saturday there is a game, the battle of, uh, I guess you'd call it the nation capital area. 
the Washington football team against the Ravens down in D.C., which means they're outside the actual capital itself in Landover. Um, the Washington football team against the Ravens. Who you got? You know, the Ravens haven't lost a preseason game since 2016, Jody. That's, why, that's why I'm asking, Mr. Kerr. Very good. How about how the hell do you do that? Go year on top of years and never lose a preseason game. We were just talking with Mike Sielski about Andy Reid and his coaching tree. Oh, John Harbaugh is part of that coaching tree, and he's got one of those Super Bowl victories in his back pocket. And he is maybe the greatest preseason coach of all time. They're proud of that too. Uh, you know, they they were talking about that yesterday in practice. Like Harbaugh downplays a little bit, but he will open up and they'll say, "Look, there have been a lot of guys, and a lot of guys are on other rosters that are proud of this." And he said, "We take everything. You know, they don't try to win the game. I don't think they do." But he said, "Look, we we plan for games. It's and that's just part of our culture and part of our philosophy here. And every guy plays the final snap. And look, they, they do." They have not played Lamar Jackson at all this preseason. Obviously, with COVID stuff, Trace McSorley got hurt. They're on Tyler Huntley, and they're still winning these games. And I just think it's, you know, he's right. I just think the Ravens take a little bit of pride in it because they know, look, it's them and Vince Lombardi. I, I mean, it's it's meaningless in the sense, but they're proud of that. And I think it gets them ready for the year. I think that's why the Ravens go 14 and two and 12 and four. And they have these really good starts to the year. Kind of like the Chiefs when they play their starters, it's, it's an Andy Reid thing. And I know I saw the YouTube comments already. Some people already don't think Andy Reid's a great coach for whatever reason. I I, I will say this. You don't think that you don't know football. I just <laughs> will say that. And I, I'll, I'm not afraid to admit that. So I, I just think that's a thing. And uh, the Ravens are proud of it. And you know what, Trey Mack, they're going for it, man. It's, I'll be happy for if they win 20 in a row. It won't mean anything. It's just something to put in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. But, hey, stats a stat. Record's a record. All right. And I think they will achieve it against the Washington football team this week. But that's uh, just me. Um, I got one other thing that we only got a couple minutes left here. So I just want to get your take on this. And I had never even realized that it hadn't dawned on me. I told you I had a caller last night who said that uh, – Jalen uh, Travis Fulgham was being uh, shortchanged by the Eagles this year, preseason, not given enough of a chance. You disagreed. I disagreed with him on the air last night. You disagreed with him this morning with me. Also had a caller come in from a New York guy I get on my New York shows, called me down in Philly just to sing the praises of Philadelphia as a town because he came down just to grab a couple of cheesesteaks. He's a New York guy, took the train down, got off the train, went to both Pat's and Gino's because oh, he was very much in the mood. He had never been to either one, and he wanted to rate their cheesesteaks, and he likes to now uh, consider himself a cheesesteak rock on tour, uh, and he liked Gino's better than Pat's, but I like them both, and I said, slight nod to Gino's, um, and he told me what he liked on his cheesesteak, and he puts mustard on his cheesesteak. Uh -huh. No, no. That had never dawned on me. I had never even considered it as a possibility to put mustard on a cheesesteak. How does Jeff Kerr like his cheesesteak? Well, I'm a big pizza steak guy, so I go with the sauce. But if I got to go regular cheesesteak, it is definitely uh, no cheese whiz. I use American cheese. Um, I, I, know, I know you're shaking your head. I'm a Cooper Sharp guy, so I do like that. Sometimes I'll get onions, depends on the place, but usually without. I have to say this, as I'm not a Pats and Geno's guy, I call me a cheesesteak snob, whatever. I think the real battle is between Chubby's and Belisandro's over in Roxborough, but that's just me. And uh, I think he said he's coming back down next month because he wants to try Chubby's, as a matter of fact. There you um, go. He's a smart man then. There you go. Uh, I, I'm, I like Wiz. I, I, I rotate my cheeses. But usually it's either between provolone and whiz. Very rarely get to American. For me, American cheese is for one thing and one thing only. That's grilled cheese. Yeah. Yeah, grilled cheese can't be made with anything else other than American cheese. But that's about all I use American cheese for. I do Swiss on everything else. I like mushrooms on my cheesesteak. I do like uh, roasted onions, uh, cooked onions on my cheesesteak. And I'm a, must, I'm a ketchup guy. Do you put ketchup on your cheesesteak? I do not put ketchup on. I have not Patrick Mahomes. It's it's he's the I, when I interviewed him last year, 
he told me he puts ketchup on everything. Like he said, if he's going to pay for steak, he'll put whatever he wants on it, and that's ketchup. But I'm not actually a ketchup guy, believe it or not. It's it's something that I didn't like as a kid. It's weird. Uh, you know, I've had it. It's I, there's so many different flavors of ketchup now. Maybe I should get back into this. But yeah, I, I definitely not a ketchup on a cheesesteak guy. Yeah, I, I am. Uh, I like I I used to be a like Patrick Mahomes ketchup on my steak guy but my father refined my taste when i was a teenager so that's not happening son you're gonna learn to like uh steak sauce which i do use now on steak but it just doesn't work on cheese steak ketchup is fine uh on cheese steak but uh good to hear your del sandro's guy i think they're one of the best as well all right brother we'd be running out of time uh i say we do this again 22 hours from now the big question is will john mcmullen make an appearance tomorrow Will they figure out the mess that was the entrance to the Jets and Eagles practice tomorrow? There's only one way to find out. Be tuned right back here on Birds 365, 22 hours from now. If you missed any of today's show on the Jacob Media channel, listen to the podcast on your way home. Available on YouTube, Apple.